Take your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation, if you would. Revelation chapter 19, or you can look up on the screen. Take your pick. <clears throat> so I guess it'd be better if you just took a Bible, amen? Who can read that bottom line? Revelation chapter 19. Make it a little bigger. That don't help it much though, does it? All right. I had this on my mind this week and, and um, when God said to preach it, I wasn't sure exactly where he was going to go. But I think I got it. I think I got it. Revelation 19. Revelation 19 is, as far as Bible prophecy goes, that's it. Revelation 19 is pretty much the summation of what God's going to do and Jesus coming to this earth to do it. Okay? I've got a little bit. Jesus coming to this earth to do it, okay? Revelation 19 is the coming of Jesus Christ to establish His kingdom, His dominion, His authority over everything in this world and everybody that doesn't like it, too bad. Everybody that doesn't believe in Jesus is going to be in for a huge shock, okay? If... If the rapture don't get their attention, which it won't, if the rapture don't get their attention, you can count on the fact that when Jesus appears in the sky on a white horse and ten thousands upon ten thousands of his saints riding with him coming down out of the sky, if people don't believe in God then, they're going to believe in God. But they're not going to be happy about him. They're going to try to fight him who's coming down out of the sky with the beast and the false prophet and the dragon. They're going to try to fight and kill Jesus. Sorry, he's already, you already killed him once. You, don't, you should have took it then. He's already, he's already been killed once. He got over it. And he's not going to let himself get killed again. Amen. Amen. That's good clap. That's good stuff. That's a good sermon. Everybody stand to your feet. Let's go home. All right. Let's look at it in verse 11. Because there's a certain way that I'm going to go with this. I saw heaven open. Behold a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. That's what you underline. That's what I'm going to preach on. Faithful and true. I want you to think about that. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Do not tell Jesus that he's not pro-war. Do not tell that to Jesus. Okay? Now, war down here among us sometimes is necessary, but it's always hard. Don't think that we ought to just fight for everything that we want. Because there's going to be casualties both sides. Somebody's going to pay the price no matter what. So that's not something that we should just be looking for. But sometimes it has to happen. But Jesus is going to come down and he's going to fight a righteous war. If you think that the politicians of your country have always had righteous desires in the wars that our boys have fought, I don't think that's always true. Now, I wouldn't knock what our boys overseas have done, what our men have done, in any war that's ever been fought. I would, not, I would not put this on them. But I don't think that every war that our politicians started necessarily had the best interests of this country in mind. 
Maybe it was a politician's battle. Maybe it's just something that benefited them. But our boys went and did what they were told to do. They did the best that they could, as reasonable as they could, trying to spare as many lives as they could. And for that, they deserve honor. So what are you saying, Mike? What I'm saying is, I don't think I can always trust the politicians. I don't think I can always trust Congress. I don't think I can always trust the White House. And I don't think I can always trust the Pentagon. Can I hear you say amen? I, right now, I don't think I can trust the FBI. So, the one that's coming to fight the war in righteousness, what is he called in verse 11? What is he called there? Do you think that the war that Jesus fights, do you think you can trust him to fight it? That's where I'm, that's where I'm going. That's part of where I'm going with this. So look at verse 12. His eyes were as a flame of fire and his, on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now, would you like to know what that name is? Ask him. Because I don't know. Only he knows. Verse 13, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. You remember what the woman who had an issue for 12 years, what she did when she found Jesus. What did she do? Touched his garment. Why? Because the vesture that's dipped in blood is the blood is what covers and cleanses all of our sins. Remember what I taught you. It's not the red blood cells that she's going after. It's not the red blood cells that cleanse the body. It's the white ones. It's the white blood cells. That's what purifies this wicked body that we have. It's the white blood cells. And that makes sense to me now. Because now when we come, we're riding with Jesus. And our robes are pure white. Because they have been dipped in the blood of Jesus. And have been made white by the blood of the Lamb. It's the white blood cells that have taken all of our sins away from us and fought the sin battle so that you and I don't have sin no more. Amen. In his eyes were a flame of fire. Wouldn't yours be if you was fixing to ride out into battle. Amen. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no man knew but himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And I want you to underline his name is called what? Don't let anybody, don't let anybody get away with lying to you saying the Bible is not God. Jesus' very name is the Word of God. See, that was made plain in John chapter 1. It was made even plainer in 1 John chapter 5 verse 7. And now he nails it and John, and Revela John wrote Revelation. Revelation chapter 19, verse 13, is as plain as it gets. The one who's coming down from heaven is the Word of God. Now remember, the one that came down is called two things. Faithful and true. What does that tell you about the Bible? It also is faithful. And it's also true. You can always trust it, no matter what. Okay? So, verse uh, 14, this part I like. Verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Where did we get that linen? I want you to go back to the same chapter. And I want you to look in verse 8. Verse 8, the same chapter, chapter 19. This is concerning the bride who's been made ready for the marriage of the Lamb. The Bible says in verse 8, To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Let me explain that. Your Bible it's a, if it's a King James, says it right. If it's a new translation, it will lie to you. 
Because the new translations here say that the white linen is the righteous deeds or the righteous acts of the saints. That is a lie. You have not done any righteous deeds or righteous acts. And if you did, God made sure that you knew and were aware that they were filthy rags in His sight. Your righteousness alone does not, is not something you ever ought to wear and be proud of. The righteousness of Christ is what I want adorned me. It is what I will wear proudly. And it is all my boasting is, not what I have done, but what God Christ has done in me. Not you. That's why you throw them stupid Bibles away. Amen? They'll lie to you every time. It is not your own self-righteousness. It is not your own deeds. It is the righteousness that you have been granted to wear. See, here's this filthy, filthy individual who, when it comes time for the wedding, we always say, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Have you ever thought, just be honest, have you ever thought maybe one in one particular situation you might die or that the Lord might come like that day and you weren't ready? Has that ever thought ever occurred to you? I'll raise my hand just to break the ice here. I have. Lord, if I die today, oh, I'm not ready. But the way God sees it, I am. Because He knows that me in my flesh there dwells no good thing. But the moment that I leave here, it has been already granted that I can wear a white robe fine and clean. And what God is doing, He is adorning me with the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is covering me. Does that make sense? I don't have necessarily that righteousness here. But when I get there, I will be adorned in perfect righteousness. And that is a gift granted to me. It's not something that I've ever earned. God gives it to you because He loves you, because you trust what He said. That's how it works. So, back to, um, back to verse 14. The armies which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now, the horses are not clothed in fine linen, white and clean. It's us. Have you ever considered that there are horses in heaven? Now, this is not trigger and silver. These are not the good horses that died and went to heaven. Okay? Animals in this world, according to the Bible, do not ever leave this world. They're buried. Their spirit goes down. That's it for them. God already has a population of beasts in heaven. And none of them is going to hurt somebody. None of them are dogs. I didn't say that. God did. You want to know where? It's in Revelation. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers. God, for, I, you, I didn't make up the rules. I did. God's got a big sign at the pearly gate said no dogs allowed. That's what he said. Okay? It says it's the word. I got to believe it. Okay? Because, well, I better get off of that. People are going to write me emails. Because they think that Fluffy is waiting for them with waving tail. And it's, it's not true. Okay? God has spirits in heaven of different beasts. And one of them is, as far as I'm concerned, one of the most magnificent animals on earth, and that is the horse. The horse is a magnificent, it's a wonderful, it's a beautiful animal. And we think that way in American Western culture. It's why we do not eat horses. We don't eat them. We have this high opinion of them. When they are wild, we say that they have a free spirit, and we, we leave them alone. There's herds of wild mustangs still in the west of America that by law are left wild. Men are not allowed to tame them. Why? Because they represent a free spirit that represents what America is all about. 
but a tame horse that a man can, you we don't understand we ride horse we ride cars and the only thing we know about horses is how many horsepower our car is but we didn't grow up riding horses but our forefathers knew the value of a horse and for some reason Jesus Christ chose he didn't choose the camel he didn't choose an ostrich you can ride ostriches he didn't choose those animals he chose a horse to come back on that's that's beautiful as far as I'm concerned. That's why you shouldn't eat them. Amen? All right. Anyway. Uh, following on white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. What is that? It's the word of God. That with it, listen to your Bible, he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. You know what that means? Iron's unmovable, unbendable, unchangeable. That means Christ, when he establishes law on the earth, it's not going to change for anybody. It is absolute. It is going to be an iron rod kingdom. And he's going to use us. I don't want to get into it, but he, he's going to use us also with rods of iron to help him rule over the nations and to judge angels, by the way. So we've been given power and great authority. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth, treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, seven words, King of kings and Lord of lords. There will be and will be nobody higher than King Jesus. If you're a Lord, he's your Lord. If you're a king, he is your king. Amen. And you can say what you want to about the balance of political power in this world. But if God wills it, then it's done in this world. No matter what it is. If a king or a magistrate or a governor or a ruler of some kind does something in this world, it is because God allowed it to happen because He is still in charge of everybody. That's what I believe. You say, well, what I, what I think that politician did was stupid then God allowed them to do something stupid. Amen? Anyway, where am I going with this? We better pray, because it's good grief. 12 o'clock, I guess I better let you guys out. Not really, because I got a message for you. Okay? I got a message for you. So let's pray. Let's ask God to preach the message to us. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, I ask God for your help today to preach this message. I ask God, Lord, for the time to preach this message. Father, show me when to be quiet. And Lord, help me to preach it. Help me to preach it right. Help me to preach it straight. Help me to preach it, Lord, the way... Well, Jesus, you come and preach it today. That way the people get what they need to get. And that way I don't take the credit for it either way. So Lord Jesus, you come to this place and you preach and you open the book and you give to these people what they need through your Holy Spirit and that way you'll receive all the honor and praise. Bless your word. Lord, we need this today. We praise you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. What I want to preach on this morning is uh, back in um, verse 11. Revelation 19, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called two words, faithful and true. Now, King James translators chose to capitalize the faithful and the true because they knew they were names of Jesus. They were names of deity, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So there's two aspects of Jesus Christ that I want you to consider. And when we consider this, when we consider that Jesus and the Father are one, so as you think it about Jesus, you think it about God the Father, uh, Jesus and His Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, and so it is. It applies to the Holy Spirit as well. But then also, the Word and Jesus Christ are one and the same as well. So what you think about Jesus, you must then think about the Bible. The Bible is both faithful and true the bible is faithful and in true and i want you to i want you to think now and realize what it is in your life 
that you don't trust anymore. People that you don't trust anymore. Things in this world that you don't trust anymore. Why? Because you've been hurt, done dirty, done wrong, abused, ill-treated, lied to, lied on, by people that one time you looked up to. Every man in this church is capable and guilty of being unfaithful and untrue. Capable. Because they're men. They make mistakes. They don't do everything right. They don't say everything right. They don't think everything right. Some worse than others. Every politician, hey, let me get to my list here. Every politician in this world is capable of being both unfaithful and untrue. Not doing what they said they were going to do when they got in office. Think about it. Everybody that's ever run for election, local, statewide, and national, they always come down to the level of the, of the common man and they make these claims about what they're going to do for you. To the conservative, they say, we're going to lower your taxes. We're going to try to get uh, e equal uh, uh, things for, pe for people who are uh, people of faith and Christians than for everybody else. We're going to try to get rid of abortion. They'll say that to, they'll say that to these people. And then to the liberal over here, they'll say, we're going to get you more money. We're going to try to increase programs. We're going to try to uh, get an increase and in, uh, for those who are for those who are poverty, those who are below the poverty line, those who are uh, mentally handicapped, those who are who are being abused by this. We're going to try to get you more money, and we're going to try to uh, bring it more open to where we can marry. So they say it to everybody. They try to speak to this guy over here and this guy over here. Whatever they need to get the votes, that's what they're going to do. And all they do is use the people to get an office. And then once they get there, they're not in your pocket anymore. Because you gave $25 campaign. They're in the pocket of whoever gave $100,000 to the campaign. That's who they owe it to. And if you think otherwise, you're wrong. We have, we have unfaithful politicians. We have unfaithful judges. We have unfaithful pastors and shepherds in this country. We have un have had unfaithful friends. People that you trusted. People that you confided in. People that you told secrets to. That you didn't want out there. Next thing you know, it's all over Facebook. Next thing you know, everybody else knows. Unfaithful friends. Unfaithful family members. The truth of it is, all of us are untrue and unfaithful to a varying degree, Some are worse than others. So two ways to preach this. Number one, if you're a ruler, if you're a governor, if you're a congressman, if you're a judge, if you're a president, mayor, CEO, if you're the head of a company, if you're the boss of your place, you are middle management, if you are a shop steward, if you are just a foreman on the job, or whatever, team leader. Two things you could try to be throughout that day is faithful, faithful to your employer, faithful to your men or your women, your team. Two, true. True to your boss, true to your employer, you're not stealing time. You're not stealing money from them. You're not stealing merchandise from them. You're not, you're not taking anything away from them that doesn't belong to you. Number two, you're going to be true to your team members. You're going to be true to them. That if it's this way, then you've got it this way. I can't help it, but this is the way it is. Don't lie to those people. Don't fill them with false hopes and false dreams only for them to find out the truth and to find out that you use them 
to get ahead in life. Does that make sense to everybody? How about a faithful husband? Faithful husband. Somebody that's not going to lie to their wife. Somebody that's not going to lie to their children. Somebody that's going to be honest and forthright in their dealings at home. And their dealings everywhere else. That what the family knows about them is what the community knows about them. Is what his boss knows about them. And what his church knows about them. And that they're all saying the same thing. He's an honest guy. Because if three people say you're an honest person, and yet a fourth person says, let me tell you what he's like when he's around me. The guy lies through his teeth. That I've never heard the guy tell the truth one time. Did you know that's somebody else? Faithful pastor. I know this message is listened to by other men who are pastoring. They listen to it later on in the week. Let me encourage you of men, as men of God, be faithful unto the Lord Jesus Christ and be faithful to His Word. That means when you study, put down the commentaries, put down the denominational book and read that Bible for what that Bible says and follow what that Bible and believe what that Bible says regardless of what everybody else says it says. Now if everybody else says something and then the Bible says something and they are fine. But if the Bible says it one way and the boys at the college told you another, then you believe the book and not what everybody else says. You be faithful to this book. You be faithful to your people. If you are using that church only because they're going to lift you up so you can get another down the road, tell them. That way they can decide whether they want to keep you or not. Too many pastors are using their churches as a stepping stone to get from one place to another. I learned that in Bible college. And I learned it from pastors. Who they say way up. Take this little church now. Do good there. And then go to the next one. And then build that one up. When you got that building up, you got a name. Now, now somebody's going to offer you a job. Take it. Go to that next church. Now you got a church of 150. Build it up to 250. When you do that, somebody's going to offer you a job of 500. Take that. That's what I... If you're going to be that way, be that way. But be honest about the church that you're using to get you there. Pastors, be faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. Be an honest, gentle shepherd to your people. Be faithful and be true to them. Judges. Judges. I don't know if we have any judges that listen. Judges. We need judges on the bench that will be faithful to the Constitution of the United States of America and be true to the American people and to do justice and liberty and to make things equal when they judge. Make sure there's equity coming out of our courtrooms. Because the people know that if that person did a crime and you only give them six months probation, that's not equity. It's not equity. That person should be punished commensurate with the crime that the, they committed and the people that that person hurt. That's what we need on the court. Jesus, when he comes, he's going to do exactly that. You... Be faithful friends. Be true friends. The people that have come to you be, to befriend them and the people that you're with, we need our friends, don't we? We need our friends. We need people that we can talk to. People that will come talk to us. People that love us. People that care about us. People that will rejoice when we rejoice. People that will suffer when we suffer. People that will... Come to us when they have an issue in life and they get honest answers. People that either we can go to them for honest answers or we know they will come to us and point things out. You're not doing right. We need faithful friends and we need to be faithful friends. We need to be true friends. This idea of Facebook friendship. I trust it. And neither should you. Do not. Let me, let me help you with something. Facebook is authorized to read everything that you write, both public and private. And private messages. I had a guy confess things to me via Facebook Messenger. And I wrote back to him and said, 
do not write this ever again on Facebook. Because they have a right to read every type. Even if you typed it in and deleted it, did you know that they recorded it? Some of you are sweating right now. You mean, yeah. Don't trust them. And if, if there's somebody on Facebook that befriended you or you befriended them and you have not personally met them or know them and know what they look like and know what kind of person they are, don't treat them like they're your closest friend and you can tell them things. They're going to turn on you and they're going to expose you and they're going to tell on you and they're going to tell everything that they know about you. They're not your friend. Now, isn't that bad? Isn't that terrible people do that? Don't you dare do that to somebody. You know what the Bible says about... I can't remember exactly the words. But somebody who's not a real friend will be a talebearer to you. But a true friend will keep secrets. And what you know about somebody and you promise to keep it to yourself, then don't you ever share it with another individual, including in a prayer group. Because all is tailbearing. And you're not a very good friend of them. You're not. Deuteronomy 7, 9. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. What does it say? He's faithful. You know what God will never do? God will never tell anybody the sins that you confess to Him. Hey, young people, listen. You know what God will do? God will tell your mom and or your dad and or your grandparents things that you're trying to keep hidden from them. Won't he? Won't he, Melissa? Doesn't let your parents find out things that you did that you don't want them to find out. Every adult in here who knows what I'm talking about, say amen, raise your hand, clap your hands. He will tell on you. Why? He loves you and he loves your parents and he knows what you're doing and he's going to get you caught and get you in trouble for your own good. I ran a school here for 12 years and the things that God showed me was going on I was. I walked around, the, walked through here one day, and walked to the water uh, thing to get a drink of water, and there was a guy and a girl student here, neck and neck, making out just in that little hole there by the water fountain. And I had no idea they were back there. I was just going back, sister, for a drink, and I went. Hmm. Guess what God wanted me to find out? Oh, they were shaking. God sometimes will try to use your parents to wake you up to things you don't want mom and dad to find. And it's to shake you and to scare you so much that you don't want to do that ever again. Amen. God's faithful God. What God knows on you, He won't tell. What you confess to Him, as far as earned, it's over with. And He'll never, He'll never, I don't care if you go do it again, He'll never bring that back up again. 1 Samuel 2.35, Oh, raise me up a faithful priest that should do according to that. Who do you think He's talking about? He's thinking about Jesus. That should do that which is in my heart and in my mind, and I will build Him a sure house, and He shall walk before mine anointed. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Psalm 40 verse 9, I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips. O Lord, thou knowest, I have not hid thy righteousness within my heart. I have declared thy faithfulness and thy salvation. I have not concealed thy loving kindness and thy truth from the great congregation. Withhold not thou thy mercies from me, O Lord. Let thy loving kindness and thy truth continually preserve me for innumerable evils. Um, for a new, where is it? I lost my place here. Appreciate it. For innumerable evils have compassed me about. Mine iniquities um, are more than the hairs of mine. Heart faileth me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and confounded together that seek after my soul to destroy it. Let them be driven backward and put to shame that wish me evil. Let them be desolate for reward of their shame that say unto me, Aha, aha. Let all those that seek thee rejoice and in thy salvation and love thy salvation. I read that wrong, didn't I? Let all that seek thee rejoice and be glad in thee. Let us such love thy salvation. Say continually, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinketh upon me. Thou art my help and my deliverer. Make no tearing. Oh my God. God's faithful. When everybody else has abandoned you, God's faithful. Now, God always says to us, I'm number one. I'm number one. I'm first. I'm number one. God says, I'm a jealous God. I'll have no other gods before me. So you know what it'll do. When we begin putting other things before God, God will then reveal to you, and this hurts, God will then just how much those gods or those things or those people that you put before God, just how much they're not faithful to you. And just how much they're not being honest with you. To let you see their failures. Now I tell people all the time, do not put me on a pedestal. Don't lift me up. Don't magnify me. Don't glorify me. Don't say, oh, Pastor Mike, we couldn't do it without you. Because trouble. Because what God may do is He may ruin my image in your mind. Okay? Now, I'm fine with that, but then I'm the one that gets the mails from people saying, you're not who I thought you were. I hate you. I get those. I get them. And I'm sorry about that. But I've been trying to tell everybody for years, I am not who some of you think I am. My wife knows me. She knows who I really am. She loves me anyway. But my wife does not put me on the pedestal that some other people do. Only God is faithful. And only the truth. Nobody else is. Some to worse levels than others. I get that. But your first, your true, your only God must be Jesus Christ. He's never failed you. He's never been unfaithful to you. He's never let you down. He's never hurt you. He's never lied to you. He has only told you all the truth. Sometimes we didn't want to hear it at certain times. But God knows that we needed to hear it. And so He let us know. God never lies. He's never wrong. He's always has you and what's best for you in verse 12. When it talks about how we're to be chastened by God, it says it like this. Your earthly fathers chastened you, but when they chastened you, it was for their pleasure. What does that tell you about mom and dad? Oh, I'm going to love doing this. What does that tell you? But he said, God you for your own good. 
Not that it pleased, not that it satisfies something with God. The only thing that satisfies God was the blood of Jesus Christ. So chastening you does not satisfy God's righteousness. Chastening you helps you understand where you went wrong and helps you. Even when God's mean to you, he does it for your own benefit, never himself. He always has you in mind. God, I, how many verses y'all want me to read? Ron's ready to write it down. Okay. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, and with my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness unto all generations. Adults, you know what you do when you grow up? You tell your kids, God's been faithful to me. Let me tell you something. Your daddy has done things wrong. Your daddy hasn't been honest with you sometimes. Sometimes your dad did things. Sometimes I whipped you when it, you shouldn't have got it. Sometimes I didn't whip you when you should have got it. Sometimes dads and moms fail. Sometimes dads and moms say things wrong. But son, let me tell you, God never fails you. See, that's what we're supposed to be doing. For I've said mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I've made a covenant with my chosen. I've sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever. And build up thy throne to all generations. See, Lord, the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord. Thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the supposed to proclaim it right here. In the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. And to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. Don't call me Reverend Mike either. Or Reverend Hoggard. Get in trouble. I'm not Reverend anything. The reverence belongs to Jesus. Okay? For who in the heaven can be compared unto God? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord unto thee or to thy faithfulness round about thee. God's faithful. God's faithful. God is faithful to this church. I found that out. God is going to be faithful to you at your worst time. God is going to be faithful to you. At your very best, God is still going to be faithful to you. God is always protect you. He's go if you put yourself under God's protection, you're under his protection. Did you know that God will not let somebody come out after you for sins that you have that God has pardoned and has freed you from? He'll protect you from all those that are coming against you. God will protect you. This better than having a God This better than having a mafia. You know mafia will go and say, "No, you need protection." For 10% of your profits, you're going to get protection from us. And they'll protect you as long as you keep paying. And they won't let anybody touch you. God's got it better than that. For absolutely nothing but His love for you protect you from everything that comes against you, no matter what it is. You might get scared. God's not going to let them come and get you. He never has. He never has. And He never will. Guys, let's strive to be faithful like God is. Faithful to our wives. Faithful to our children. Families. Faithful to our jobs. Faithful to our jobs. If that man or that woman's paying you money, you go do, and you do better than what they're expecting out of you. You do more than what they're paying you for. You go do it. I don't care what the union hall says. To, you better slow down now. You go and you outshine them all because God is your God and God's teaching you how to be faithful means if you're supposed to be there at 8 o'clock, you show up at 7.30 and wait in the parking lot. Amen! Be faithful to your family. Be faithful to your job. The country, be faithful to your church. Can I say that here? Can I say that here? Be faithful to your church. I didn't say pay more tithes than somebody else. I said if you have it to pay, then give it. Be faithful. We don't send notifications out for people who haven't paid enough tithes. That's wicked. And they do it. You are expected to be faithful and it's all on you whether or not you're going to do it or not. You be faithful. Only God knows this, but you be faithful. You be faithful in your attendance. You be faithful in your prayer life. You be faithful in your Bible reading. You, you alone be faithful. Be faithful to yourself. Doing this for 
Because I know that I need. I know that I need to be in church more. I know that I need to be in my Bible more. I know that I need to pray more. I know I could be giving more. And I'm just telling you, when you go to prove who you're proving it to, you're not proving it to me, you're not proving it to anybody else in the church because they're not supposed to know about it. You prove it to yourself and to God. It's your own calling, not what you can show off to everybody else. You be faithful like God is faithful. Did that preach enough? John said, Amen. So, stand to your feet. Do this. I've only got, I've only got 12 more verses. And they're long. I guess message through. I'm going to open the altars up. I'm not going to sit here and beg everybody, but I'm going to open them up and we're going to have a time of prayer. If you need to be more faithful, you pray. You pray standing there. You pray bowing here. You pray. You folks online, if you need to be more faithful, you come, you pray, bow where you are, go to a closet somewhere in your house, pull over the car, whatever, and then you pray. Young people, you need to be more faithful. More faithful to your schoolwork. More, and that's not stupid either. Faithful to schoolwork. Every adult in here wishes they would have done better in school than what they did. Am I right? Every one of them. Every is they could go back with the mature brain that they have now and use it to go back to school with. Because they do a lot better than what they did. More faithful, young people, more faithful to your mom and dad. More faithful to your church. Bible, more faithful to prayer. Bible memorization. More faithful to yourself because the real benefit of faithfulness always goes to you, not anybody else. Husbands, wives, a better husband better servant to your wife. A leader who is yet the servant to his family, to his wife, is to his children. His time is spent with them, for them. And God will reward you in, in, in due season. You be faithful to your family. Wives. Be faithful wives. Be faithful to your children, to your grandchildren, to your husband. Be faithful to your church. Faithful to give time to, to give time to Bible reading. The only person in the world who'll know about it is you. Nobody's going to boss you around. You're an adult. You're a grown-up now. You don't need somebody to boss you around, tell you when to do this, when to do that. Good grief. You be more faithful because you want to do it like Jesus is faithful to you. <clears throat> I wish and pray that I could be more faithful to my church. I really mean that. To this church. To you people. Father in heaven, we come before you today. And Lord, I guess all of us are lacking. We're lacking in faithfulness. We believe it, but faith without works is dead. So Father, help us, dear God, to be faithful. Faithful to our wives. Faithful to our families. Faithful to our church and our church's needs physically, spiritually faithful to our Bible read it more 
faithful to prayer. Who, who sees it when you pray? Nobody does. Do you do it enough? Help us, God, to be faithful like you are to us. You never, you never fail us. You never fail us. Help us to be faithful friends to people conditionally. To long suffer with them and to confide, to be confided in by them and not be a talebearer, not be a gossip. But to take what you know and give it to the Lord and say, God, I'll let you have this. I can't bear it. My friend is curious. The Lord, I'm going to give it to you because you're my friend. You see, Jesus is a faithful friend to us who never, ever, ever hurt us, ever. He's always supported us. He's always loved us and always listened to us. Whether we were in a good mood or bad mood, He always has. God, help me to be a faithful friend. Faithful church member. Faithful Bible reader. Faithful wife. Faithful husband. Not having anybody else in place of our husband or wife or children. God, help me to be faithful to my family, my wife. Help me to be faithful to my church. God, help me to be more faithful like you are. Help me to love them like you do. Help me to pray for them like you hear their prayers. Help me to care about them and their needs like you asking for help, Lord, because I do not have it in me. I can't do it by myself. I try it and I can't do it. God, it must come from you. So God, I'm asking for your help. And these people are asking for your help. You and you alone are the one that can help them. You do it, Father, because you're their God. And you're their Savior and you're their Lord. And they don't trust anybody else to hear, Father, what it is you're hearing right now. They don't trust anybody else. They trust you. So, Father, you know you, you don't let them down. I know. Give them a sign, Lord. Give them a token, God, that you're, not, you're going to be faithful to them no matter what. Give them that blessing today. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all of God's people said, Glad you came to God's house this morning.